Well, there's an old story about two men who were standing on the Golden Gate Bridge, and as one of them tells a story, he said, I heard the guy next to me whisper, what an awesome God. I was admiring the view. And uh, so I said to him, oh, are you a Christian? And he said, yes, I am. I said, so am I. And we shook hands. I said, are you a liberal or a fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a fundamental Christian. I said, so am I. And we smiled and nodded at each other. I said, are you a covenant or dispensational fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a dispensational fundamental Christian. I said, so am I. And we agreed to send Christmas cards to each other this year. I said, are you an Acts 9 or an Acts 13 dispensational fundamental Christian? He said, I'm an Acts 9 dispensational fundamental Christian. I said, so am I. And we hugged one another right there on the bridge. I said, are you a pre-trib or post-trib Acts 9 dispensational fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a pre-trib Acts 9 dispensational fundamental Christian. I said, so am I. And we agreed to exchange our children for the summer. I said, are you a 12 in or a 12 out pre-trib Acts 9 dispensational fundamental Christian? He said, I'm a 12 in pre-trib Acts 9 dispensational fundamental Christian. I said, you are, you heretic. And I pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> not a true story. <laughs> Thankfully, kids, not true. But there is a truth there, is there not? And the truth is that our disagreements can oftentimes result in divisions. Our disagreements can oftentimes result in divisions. Now, I think it was on purpose that Jesus, on the night they came to arrest him, take him away and kill him, allowed his disciples to hear him pray. And what does he pray for? I pray, Father, that they may all be one, so that the world may know that you have sent me. Wow. Look. In religion, one believer stands separated from another religion. In politics, one citizen stands divided from another citizen. On our college campuses, one student stands separated from another student. In our families, one sibling separated from another sibling. How is it that we can participate in the unity for which Jesus prays? That's the question today. And, and with that question, it's not surprising that the Apostle Paul, as he's writing his letter to Rome, the church in Rome, will now turn next to our disagreements, what he calls quarreling over opinions. Let's read that. Would you open up your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12? If you didn't bring a Bible, grab the black book in the rack in front of you there, please, and turn to page 923. If you're able, let's stand together. We'll read this out loud together. Kids, this is something we do every week as a way that, to honor the one who inspired this word, our Savior Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. When we're done reading, I'll say, this is the word of the Lord, so that if you believe it, you can say, thanks be to God. Listen carefully, you're reading his holy word. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. Now, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. And those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the living and the dead. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. 
So then each of us will be accountable to God. And this is the word of the Lord. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord lasts forever. Please be seated. Disagreements. Disagreements. Not exactly clear what Paul has in mind here. Pretty sure he's not talking about what we could call the great truths of the gospel. I mean, for 11 chapters, he, he's been arguing for the, the great truths of the gospel. And then he'll give his life in the end for these truths. He seems to be focusing on uh, smaller things of everyday life. Uh, he, he mentions food and uh, feast days or festivals. And, and in verse 21, he'll mention wine. Uh, things that provoke quarreling over opinions. He uses the example a lot here of, of, of vegetarians, which I'm fine with. Um, I, I, I'm actually a vegetarian, and I thought that was super cool um, until my wife took me to the Volunteer Park Conservatory where um, they have carnivorous plants. And this really confused me. I mean, I thought if, if God would want us to be vegetarians, why would he create meat-eating vegetables? <laughs> so I'm still wrestling with wrestling with that. But actually, the, the, the kind of vegetarians that are in Rome are not the, the kind that, that we might be today. Um, there are probably two different reasons that they're not eating meat. Uh, on the one hand, it might be because they're trying to eat kosher. Remember Daniel? He does this. He, he just eats vegetables because it's just safer not to, then you don't have to worry about the kosher laws. Or it may be that there are some concerns about idols. Uh, this is true in Corinth, where Paul's writing from. He's in Corinth. They have an issue with this because the food in the marketplace was, was already sacrificed to an idol. And, and, and you bought it, and you might not know whether it was already a part of pagan worship or not. And so out of conscience, some people just stopped eating uh, meat. He's not really that concerned about the particulars here. He says you can kind of go either way on this or any kinds of number of issues. What he's really wanted to do is surface the, the, the idea of disagreement. And the question, what do we do as followers of Jesus with our, with our disagreements? And the first thing that, that, that I want to call to your attention, it seems a little bit obvious, is it's just don't, dis, don't, don't avoid the disagreement. Don't ignore the disagreement. Right? But Paul doesn't. He's actually surfacing he's several illustrations of things that they disagree. Don't ignore this because they affect the relationship. He talks about weak uh, uh, believers. And in, if you look at the next chapter down there, verse 1 and 15, it's, they're strong believers, weak and strong. This is kind of interesting. Language can be a little bit confusing. What he means by a weak believer or, or weak sister or brother is somebody who has really strong convictions about something. And he calls them weak because there's a risk that they might be missing out on the implications of the gospel. And, and, and he says, you know, but that may be the way they think about it. Um, it, it. Weak, by the way, it's not a pejorative term here. It's more a matter of sensitivity and kindness. You know, you have a brother who's weak in this way. And the strong are those who have this strong sense of freedom in a particular uh, area. You, you could actually call the person who's sort of weak, or, or, which in this case it would be someone who's not eating vegetables, uh, the, the conservative. And you could call the person who's just diving in and eating everything, you know, the, the liberal, because they have a sense of freedom there. And the point for Paul is really to work out the implications of the gospel in, in, in terms of your diet, so that it should shape the way that you eat or, or don't eat. But he's, he's concerned that they don't divide over this. He, he doesn't want them to fall into quarreling over op opinions. That, that affects relationship, unity. What's so interesting to me is that it's context sensitive. You, you may in one context be strong, in another context you may be weak. Follow this if you, if you can. Uh, in, in Rome, the people who weren't eating meat were probably not eating meat because they were kind of trying to lean Jewish. In, in Corinth, which is Greek, the people that were not eating meat were probably not eating meat because they were kind of leaning Greek because they, you know, they'd come out of a pagan lifestyle. and so. The point is, you could not eat meat for a lot of different reasons. And if you're in one context, you'd be the weaker brother. In another context, you might be the stronger brother. And it, it, it's not so much about which one you are or which is good or bad. It's really about the relationship. So don't ignore the disagreement because the relationship matters. But then the other reason not to d ignore the disagreement is that truth matters. You know, that both of these groups, are, they're sincerely trying to get at, at, at what's true 
there's a thing that I refer to sometimes as the, the graduate student dilemma. One time, a friend of mine who was a graduate student in philosophy said to me that a lot of grad students face this challenge when they, they're confronted by a whole range of different truth claims that are in conflict with one another. They say there are two, he said there are two tendencies. One is just to assume, well, they must all be true. And the other is to assume that, well, none of them must be true. And it's a pretty natural tendency for us. Uh, one will make you a, a, a nihilist, that nothing's true. The other will make you a relativist, that they're all sort of equally true in some way. And Paul's not either of those. He says don't dis- uh, ignore the disagreement because uh, there's truth here. And we're after truth. We're all seeking truth. So he has two cautions. One is don't minimize the difference. And the other is don't neglect the discovery. Look at verse 10. He says, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Don't, he says, don't minimize the difference. You know, all ideas are not good ideas, although we tell ourselves that in brainstorming sessions. All, every idea is not a good idea. And we may not know which is which, but someday we will. We'll stand before God to whom we are all accountable. See, truth matters to this God. Goodness matters to this God. Beauty matters to this God. Justice matters to this God. So, you know, don't minimize these differences. On the other hand, he says, you know, don't neglect the discovery. Look at verse 5. He says, let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Now, don't neglect this process of discovery. What he's saying there in verse 5 is essentially that process of discovery. Work it all the way out in your own mind. Take it all the way. Pursue it. There's a this, this, this learning that's happening. It's a discovery that's happening. And this is consistent with the encouragement he's already given us in the beginning of chapter 12. He said, don't be squeezed into the mold of the world around you or the culture, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We talked about last week how our consciences need to be renewed through word and spirit. Paul believes in this. We're all in this process of discovery and change, growth. Exploring difference can, in fact, lead to discovery. It, it, it can even lead to unity. Scott Peck, in his uh, book, the, uh, what is the name of his book? Oh, Diff- the Different Drum, talks about the four stages of developing community. This might be useful for you. You might think about your own family, for example, your small group. The four stages that we move through as we move towards unity in relationship with other people. The first stage he calls pseudo-community. And this is that first stage where it's perfectly natural. We also, we tar- we initially, we want to minimize the differences. We, we hide our true self from, from one another. We avoid conflict. And the result is, is pseudo-community. This is also called dating, actually. <laughs> right? Dating is where we put our best foot forward, and we don't want you to see anything else. Okay, the second stage is chaos. It's kind of an ominous name. But we have to get to it to get through it. it, it chaos is that stage where we start to surface some of our, our differences. Uh, oh, we realize we, we don't agree on everything. Oh, this is a little bit unpleasant. It's part of the relationship. It is an experience of frustration, annoyance, disappointment, and this is called marriage. <laughs> we pull the other foot out. Now they're both out, right? And, and, and chaos, there's chaos, and we try to manage the chaos by control, uh, manipulation. Sometimes we blame our leaders. Sometimes we want to leave the relationship or the community entirely chaos. It's uncomfortable. But if we move through chaos, we get to third stage, emptiness. Emptiness. It's a good thing. It's actually about vulnerability. Uh, emptiness is about uh, being known and knowing someone as, as uh, they really are. And to, to get there, what we have to do is empty ourselves of things like pride or biases, actually anything that hinders us from listening and from learning from one another. And then the fourth stage is true community, and this is the goal, and this is where you get genuine empathy. And here, unity is starting to, to, to come uh, to bloom because now we, we've gotten past the differences to sort of some of the shared values that are there. We've gotten past the differences to sort of the emotional substrata where we really understand what the other is feeling like, what, what their emotional experience is. And there's a mutual appreciation uh, for one another. There's empathy here, true community. Now, these, this is not easy. Just look at the church, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ, the Orthodox, don't recognize the Roman Catholics, and the Roman Catholics don't recognize the Protestants, and the Protestants don't recognize the Pope, and Baptists don't recognize each other in the liquor store, and we, it's all divided. Actually, I know I'm going to get, I, I'm just kidding. I'm going to get emails about that. I'm proud to be numbered among our many Baptists here at UPC. 
But look what Paul's saying. Let's look at the headline of this text. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Here's the wisdom of God. Here's what Paul's driving at. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Notice what he does here. He's distinguishing the person from the position. He's distinguishing the human being from the disagreement. He can, he can make the distinction. Oftentimes, when we're in hot disagreement, we can't make that description. We've conflated the issue and the person. But let me say, you are not your beliefs. That other person is not an argument. They're, they may be quarreling, but the, but the quarreling is not the relationship. The communion is. The communion of, of souls is the relationship. And Paul recognizes that distinction. And he encourages us. When we forget this, what happens? We treat the other as object. We treat the other as something to defeat or get past or work around. Uh, Paul uses language like um, uh, despise. Don't despise. Don't pass judgment. He said when we do this, we can reduce the other in a way that dehumanizes them that actually even makes it okay for us somehow to demonize them. And we see this in our discourse today, uh, everywhere. Somehow, you and I have, have come to live in a culture that reduces our disagreements to identities. I, think about that. Our disagreements have become identities. We don't say, oh, I'm a person who eats vegetables. We say, I'm a vegetarian. And when we do that, then what we end up doing is flattening out our hu mutual humanity around a single issue. So Paul says, look, here, here are the two dimensions of agreeing to disagree agreeably. And let me give them to you in, in turn. First is welcome the person who's weak in faith. That's the per first half of verse one. Welcome the person who is weak in faith. faith. And, and, and the word welcome here describes a posture, which I've shared with you before. It's a wonderful Greek word combining two words, receive and towards, receive and towards. That aspect of receive is a picture of somebody opening up their arms to take something or someone in, receive. And then the word towards um, connotes motion, receive towards, take a step towards the other. And actually this verb is in an interesting voice. It's not passive, it's not active. It's a kind of unusual voice in, in the New Testament where it, it both affects the person who performs the action and the person who re receives the action. The point is when you receive someone towards, when you welcome someone this way, it will not only change them, it will change you in the process. So, so receive towards. In other words, welcome the person. The other aspect of this, uh, that we see is to, to give the disagreement to Jesus. That's clearest in verse four, where he says, the Lord is able to make them stand. He means whoever is on the other side of your disagreement, the Lord is able to make them stand. Now there's a picture that he's working with in this passage it's a, of a person walking along, maybe two people walking along, someone stumbles and they fall and now they're lying flat. Paul says, you know, the Lord's able to make them stand. You don't have to do that. Which is interesting, because the language of stand in the, in the early church, that was the language of re resurrection. This is one of the great words that they used to describe the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It, so Paul fits right in with everything he's been saying for 13 chapters, that Jesus Christ is the one, the risen one, who makes us stand. Jesus does that work. Not you, not the other. Jesus is the one who, who makes us stand. He's the one who makes us stand before God in, 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 in his righteousness. You're right before God, not because you got the argument right, but because you're in Jesus Christ. And, and same with the other person. So if you, you can look at this later, look at Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. He says, we're standing in grace. And, and that means you're welcome before God in Jesus. Right now, totally accepted by grace. This is a good news. And it means that at, at the, at the, on the last day, when Jesus returns, we will all stand before him and we will be like him, the gospel tells us. So there's a promise of transformation. And the word able, he's able to make you stand, is the Greek word related to the word dunamis, which we get our English word dynamite. He's saying he is able, he has the power to make us stand. So this is the promise. You know, you're not the one who needs to resolve this difficulty. You don't have to fix the position of the other. What you have to do is welcome them, invite them in, 
Grab a hold of the person with both arms and then give the disagreement to Jesus. Entrust them and the other point of view to Jesus. He's able to work it out. This is, this is really liberating. And what Paul's doing is he's working out the implications of the good news of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, for our disagreements. Our unity is not in our, our, our arguments. Our unity is not in our creed. Our unity is in a person. Our unity is in, in Jesus, and he's alive. He stands in our midst, and he's able to make us stand before God, to make us right in every sense of that word, before God. So take the person in and give the disagreements to Jesus. Let Jesus work on their opinions. Don't quarrel over them. Now, Presbyterians have known how to do this. Uh, if you look at our book of order, there's a little uh, introduction to it that goes all the way back to 1788. Uh, I'm sure J.J. reads this for his devotions in the morning. The, the, the Synod of New York and Philadelphia came up with eight principles that are almost like the Bill of Rights for Christians. And I want to just read three of them because three are so relevant to this topic. The first is this, God alone is Lord of the conscience. God alone is Lord of the conscience, meaning we're not bound by any human authority and we're not to bind others as well. The second is truth is in order to goodness, which means we must know the truth to live well. It's that process of discovery. And the third is, and here's the, here's the money, persons of good character and principle may differ. Did I? Persons of good character and principle may differ. Wouldn't you like to see that on a sign in every boardroom, in every classroom, in every kitchen in America? I think it would help. And by the way, this is how the movement of Jesus will grow. <clears throat> I was listening to Mark Shield the other day, who's a political commentator, and he's sort of bemoaning the divisiveness of American politics and this insistence that everybody kind of agree on this platform or that platform. And he's saying, I've learned over the years that politics is the business of addition, not subtraction. The business of addition, not subtraction. If you want to win an election, you actually have to add people to your position. He says, we're not looking for heretics. We should be looking for converts. And that's so interesting, because in our political discourse today, we seem to be saying, are you with me or not? And then we make you pay a price if you're not with me, if we're drawing this circle. And, and, and that circle is getting so small that pretty soon, the only person who's allowed to stand in that circle is somebody who agrees with me in every way. And you know who ends up standing in that circle? Me, alone. Oh, see, there's, there's a lesson for us here. I mean, UPC has always held firmly to the great truths of the gospel. And I'm so grateful for that. And that's why I'm here. And I trust that's why you're here. But we've also learned how to hold loosely to everything else. And we need to learn this if we're going to join our neighbors in, in joining Jesus. If we're going to build a relationship with our neighbors, we, we need to learn how to hold loosely to the things, points of, of disagreement with them. Yes, Jesus is Lord. That's the good news. That's our confession of faith. Yes, we stand under the authority of God's word, the scripture. But if we insist that everybody work it out in exactly the same way we work it out, we're going to be standing in a very small circle. And Jesus is not that way. Paul knows that. And we know that. Welcome the person. Give the disagreement to Jesus. Take the person in and give the disagreement to Jesus. Let me tell you a story. If I haven't made you uncomfortable yet, I'm going to make you a little bit more uncomfortable. Uh, Richard Mao is the former president of Fuller Theological Seminary, and recently he wrote an article for the Huffington Post in which he talks about a lecture he had given on civility on a college campus. As soon as the lecture was over, a student came up to him and said to him, uh, I, I wish I could have heard what you had said tonight a couple months ago because the student was a leader at one of the Christian groups on campus, and apparently this particular Christian group had decided to run an advertisement uh, defending a biblical view of traditional marriage. And immediately, the LGBTQ group ran their own ad denouncing the Christians. <laughs> and, and letters ensued, and divisions deepened, and the student asked Dr. Mao what they could have done differently. 
And he said this, well, you, you could have met with their leaders before going public. Uh, you could have reviewed the ad with them to see if there were anything disrespectful in it. And you could have invited them to lunch to dialogue about the issue. Wow, the student replied, I, I wish we had done that. Well, a month later, Dr. Mao received a letter from the student. He said, after you and I talked, we contacted the gay lesbian leaders. And we told them that we are very sorry we had not met with them privately before publishing our ad, and we asked them if we could meet over lunch, and they accepted. Apparently, the meeting started poorly. The LGBTQ plus folks were very angry, but at one point, one of them told them a story about some terrible experiences that she had experienced when she was a teenager in a church. We were very moved by her story, he said, and we told her so. Tears were shed on both sides. We agreed not only to disagree, but to keep meeting on a regular basis. It was a tough conversation, but we were so glad we reached out. It sure beats angry public name calling. Now, nobody changed their positions, but the whole atmosphere had changed. Why? Because they took the other in and they gave the disagreement to Jesus. I want to invite you to do the same this week. This week, I'd like you to think about your community, the, the circles of community that you're in of all kinds. Think about them. Which stage are they in? Which of the four? And what can you do to bump them to the next? I know for myself, if I'm to be honest, I'd have to say this morning, my family feels like it's in pseudo community. I would say our church feels like in some ways we're in chaos. That's a, and that's an accomplishment. Remember, and I would say that the team that I'm working with most closely is a stage of, of emptiness. And I would say that my marriage this morning is at a place of true community, but I better check that when I get home. <laughs> what about you? Um, what about disagreements in your life? I wonder if the Holy Spirit would bring to your mind, just as we sit here, uh, a person with whom there's some tension. And what would it look like for you to approach them differently this week because of Jesus Christ and the good news, to agree to disagree in a way that's ag agreeable? I'd like to invite you to make a plan, and, and before you leave here, just know what your first step would be in that relationship. Because, friends, finally, you and I have what we need. That's what Paul's saying. He's working out the gospel. If you've said yes to Jesus, look, Welcome others because God has welcomed you. This is your calling and this is your equipment. You have the capacity to do this because uh, he's saying stand with others just as uh, we stand in Jesus. Welcome others just because God welcomes us. And then he says love with the joy and peace, he'll say later on, that the Holy Spirit brings because it's the Holy Spirit who pours love and joy and peace constantly into our hearts. If you're willing to join me this week, I would invite you to stand, and uh, I'd like to stand together as an act of faith and as a readiness to say yes to Jesus and pray the prayer that St. Francis of Assisi wrote, a uh, beautiful prayer. It's familiar to many of us. If you're willing, let's stand together and read this prayer as our closing prayer this morning. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring love. Where there is offense, let me bring pardon. Where there is discord, let me bring union. Where there is error, let me bring truth. Where there is doubt, let me bring faith. Where there is despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, let me bring light. Where there is sadness, let me bring joy. O oh, Master, let me not seek as much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that one receives. It is in self-forgetting that one finds. It is in pardoning that one is pardoned. It is in dying that one is raised to eternal life. Amen.